Tonight we're in Psalm 99 through 101. We'll begin here in Psalm 99, and I'll read the Psalm 2, and we'll, we'll begin our study tonight. Beginning in verse 1 here in Psalm 99, reading to verse 9, the psalmist writes, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. You answered them, O Lord our God. You were to them God who forgives, though you took vengeance on their deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Now, obviously, as we look at this psalm, let me give you a couple of very quick background uh, facts and, and then move into it. Uh, as we look at this, this is a psalm of praise. Notice with me that it is an anonymous psalm. But what it is intending to do is it's intending to praise the Lord, to exalt Him, to honor Him. It's intended to, to give glory to the Lord. And somebody might ask the question, why is it that we should give praise to the Lord? Well, in this psalm, we see the reasons why. We praise the Lord because He reigns, because He is holy, because He is powerful. We praise Him because He is great, He is exalted, and He is awesome. We praise the Lord because He is just and He is righteous, because He gave priests and prophets to the people. We praise Him because He answers prayer, and we praise Him because He is the God who forgives us of our sins. That should be ample reason to worship and praise the Lord. And that's what we look at here in Psalm 99. Now, he begins in verse 1 by simply saying, The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. So, God reigns is the way he begins. He reigns. And notice with me, it says here that he is seated between cherubim. As you read your Bible, you're going to notice that the, the cherubim are mentioned in the Old Testament some 85 different times. You'll see these cherubim mentioned because they are incredible, powerful angels. The first time you even notice the cherubim is in uh, the book of Genesis in chapter 3, verse 24. And in that particular portion of Scripture, the Bible simply says that God drove out Adam from the garden and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So they're introduced very early to us in Scripture as those who are guarding, in this particular case, they're guarding the Garden of Eden. You also see them um, in the fact that it is declared that he dwells between the cherubim. You see that this is really a reference to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is found in the Old Testament. It's found uh, in various passages, but let me read to you in, in Exodus chapter 25, verses 18 through 20. When the Lord was speaking to the nation of Israel, actually to Moses, he said, you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work, you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. He says in verse 22 of the same chapter, there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So these two angels actually were portrayed in a graphic way over the mercy seat there in the Ark of the Covenant, the place where God chose to meet with the children of Israel. 
Because the Ark of the Covenant represented God dwelling amongst men on earth, it was a place that was guarded. In this particular ark, there were two tablets of the Ten Commandments. There was Aaron's staff that budded, and there was a golden pot that contained manna. These all were bearing witness. They were bearing witness of Messiah in his prophetic, his priestly, and his kingly offices. So the cherubim were there to protect the holiness of God and are declared to be his messengers. When we look at this particular portion of Scripture, it speaks to us in verse 1, as he dwells between the cherubim. And in doing so, he says, let the earth be moved. God is reigning. He's all-powerful. He's all-great. He's awesome. He's majestic. That's the picture that we have here. And so, because he is man's response, and this is a very important thing, to this God who is so awesome, so majestic, so powerful, our response should simply be that we worship Him. That's what the Scripture calls us to do. We're to praise the Lord. That's why He says the Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. In verse 2, the Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. And so it's a picture of, of man worshiping an incredibly majestic, all-powerful, all-reigning God. And that's what we're called to do. Psalm 28, verse 7 simply says, The Lord is my strength, my shield, my heart trusted in Him. I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise Him. So the psalmist is calling everybody to worship and praise the Lord because He reigns. In verse 4, the king's strength also loves justice. You've established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at His footstool, for, he says, He is holy. He is mighty, and His holiness is made obvious through His justice and His righteousness. And so, because God is just, and because God is righteous, once again, man is called to worship and to praise Him. Psalm 98, 9 points out, that which gives us ample reason to exalt him. Remember in Psalm 98.9, uh, it's an FM station, 98.9, <laughs> <9. laughs> how it says he's coming to judge the earth with righteousness. He shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. Well, because God is a righteous judge, we have the call from God to worship him because he is righteous. And so that's the call to us. The Bible says in verses 6 and 7, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. And so God revealed himself is the point he's making. God revealed himself through Moses. God revealed himself through, uh, through Aaron, his brother. And, and God revealed himself also through Samuel. These were people that the Lord used in the Old Testament to communicate himself to people. And so he's simply speaking to us and telling us that God has revealed himself and also reminding us that all of these men interceded on behalf of Israel. You see, there were times in each one of their lives and ministries that they actually called upon God on behalf of the people. And that's what it says here in verse 6 when it says, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. And so he's using them as examples because as his servants, they called upon the Lord. They interceded on behalf of the Lord, uh, of the people to the Lord. There's an interesting scripture found in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. I can still remember the first time I ever encountered this scripture. It was actually pointed out to me by one of my professors when I was going to Biola College back in 1973. And I can remember the scripture very well because uh, the teacher, Dr. Mitchell, made a very big point in this. He spoke concerning intercessory prayer. And he said, do you know that you are called to intercede on behalf of other people? As a matter of fact, he said, you might find this scripture interesting. And he, and he read it to us. I'll read it to you. First Samuel 12, 23. He said, this is what Samuel did. And this is what Samuel said. He said, moreover, as for me. Now notice this. Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. I will teach you the good and the right way, that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. So Samuel is used as an, as an emblem, an example of an intercessor. 
an individual who prays on behalf of others. Moses did that. Aaron did that. Samuel did that because the nation of Israel had the habit of rebelling against God. And so they would intercede on behalf of the nation. And even so, the Lord is using them of, as examples. Notice in verse 7, it says, He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. And so these were, were men who, by and large, were very faithful to the Lord, and God revealed himself to them. Verse 8, You answered them, O Lord our God. You were to them God who forgives, though you took vengeance on their deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. These men interceded for the nation, and God answered their prayers, though he chastised them. And as you read the Old Testament, you'll see there were times that God did chastise the children of Israel through plagues, sometimes through fiery serpents. There was a time that he opened the earth, and, and there was a generation that died there in the wilderness. But God was the God who forgives. God is the God, in other words, who though he may chasten, his chastening lasts but just for a short while. When the Lord ministers to us, indeed, he does chasten us. There's no doubt about it because, um, because God is our Father and when we are his children. And as his children, um, we get spanked by the Lord. He does chastise us. And I have to be honest with you, like you, I don't enjoy spankings, never have, never will. But I do appreciate the fact that somebody loves me enough to chasten me. And the Lord does. The Lord loves you and loves me enough to chasten us. And so he did chastise the children of Israel out there in the wilderness. But he is the God who forgives. And one of the things that I just am so thankful for about the Lord is the Bible teaches us over and over again that, uh, that God is a forgiving God. All the way in the Old Testament, the very first book, when Adam and Eve blow it before the Lord and when they, they sin and, and disobey his commandment, you see that the Lord gives them skins of animals to wear as a prefigurement of the righteousness that they're going to have to have imputed to them by God himself. You know, in the slaughtering of the animal that they, they slew, in, that was slain in order for that, that skin to be placed on them, that there was the shedding of blood. And in the shedding of blood, there is a remission of sin. It was a prefigurement or a picture of how God was going to deal with man's sin in the future, even as the Lord allowed his own son to die on the cross for us. He's the God who forgives. There are people that I've encountered over the years who think that their sin is beyond God's forgiveness. There is no such thing as a sin beyond his forgiveness. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Nowhere in the Bible, from the old to the new, do you ever discover a sin that God cannot forgive other than the one that you refuse to allow him to forgive. When God convicts you of sin, in other words, you can make one of two decisions. One is in the conviction. You can either be drawn to him and, and throw yourself upon his mercy and say, God, forgive me, a sinner. And in doing so, the Lord says that he will wipe away your sin. He cleanses it with the blood of Jesus Christ. Or you can say, I'll take care of my sin myself. Or you can ignore it and allow it to just fester and destroy you. Because ultimately, the wages of sin is death. Without the Lord Jesus Christ atoning for us, without our recognition of his atonement as being satisfactory to, uh, to be the propitiation for our sin, to satisfy the anger of God, then, well, someone's going to have to pay for your sin. If you want to pay for it yourself, well, the Bible says you're, you're free to do so. You have the will, the choice to do so, then, then go ahead and attempt to do so. The bottom line is, is uh, none of us will ever be good enough to do anything good enough to satisfy his anger. So God intends to do something on our behalf. He satisfies his own wrath. He does that through sending his son, Jesus Christ. So Jesus dies on the cross for us. His blood is, is spilled out for us. And God recognizes his blood as being uh, sufficient, satisfying his demands. And then we as believers just receive that, not in a light fashion, by the way, through a humble fashion with a recognition of what God has done that causes our life to be drawn to him that we might serve him the rest of our days. And that's what we do. And we serve him with all of our heart because he gave to us his son. We love him. He is the God who forgives. I have met people in the past who think that their sins are beyond God's ability to forgive. And I have enc encouraged them so many times. And I've said, you have not sinned the sin that is too great for God. 
God is the God who forgives. Now, perhaps I have somebody in this room, perhaps more than one, who is thinking right now that you've gotten to the point where you, you can't be forgiven. That's just not true. You can. You can say to God, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I need your help. I need your strength. I need your forgiveness. And the Bible tells us that he is just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is a righteous and loving father. You know, my kids can be wonderful and they can be monsters. When they're wonderful, they're mine. When they're monsters, obviously, they belong to Marie and they have her nature. But, you know, my kids can be monsters, you know, like anybody else's kids can be, you know. And all it ever has really required from them, it's all that I've ever required from them. If they want to have reconciliation with me, if something's been done that is wrong, it's always been as simple as saying, I'm sorry. That's as simple as it's always been. I'm sorry. I forgive you, is what I'll say. When I, my daughter, Corinne, when she announced to Mama and Daddy that, that day that she, as an unmarried young woman, had become pregnant by her boyfriend, and when she was there in our, in our front room, and, and I'm sitting there on the couch, and she shows up and late in the, in the evening, and, and Marie looks at her and says, Honey, it's late. Are you okay? And she looks at me, and she looks at her mom, and bursts out with her tears, and, and she says, I'm pregnant, and, I, and I'm sitting there on the couch, and I'm looking at my daughter, who, who I love with all of my heart, and I look at her, and, and the first thing I say is, I think I'm going to throw up. Now, that's not intended to be funny. I felt that. My stomach felt like it was ripped open, and I was just just so sick. I mean, it hurts. It hurts bad. And as it did, I looked at her and I said, I feel like I'm going to throw up. And she looks at me with tears in her eyes. And as we spoke to her, she said, Daddy, I'm so sorry. And I remember saying something like, you know what, baby doll? There's nothing you can ever do that would make me not love you. Nothing. You're my daughter. The Lord taught me something through that. It's as if through the pages of his book, his Bible, he spoke to my heart and said, and there's nothing that you could ever do that would make me not love you because you're my son. We have the God who forgives. Never forget that. We have the Lord who, who has wiped away all of our sins, and he did it at such a cost. It was the cost of his own son, Jesus Christ, who died on that cross in a brutal fashion. How much more does he have to show us? What else does he have to do? That's why we worship him. That's why we praise him. That's why he's worthy of our praise. And that's why he can say, the Lord reigns, let the people uh, tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. That's why he says, the Lord is great. He's high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. And so that's what we do. We worship and praise him because of how good he is to us. It's a call to praise and a call to worship. We move to Psalm, nine, uh, rather Psalm 100. This is a very long psalm of five verses. Beginning at verse 1, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. And so Psalm 100 is a call to, to, uh, to joyful singing. It's to celebrate the, the rule of the Lord. It's a psalm that was sung in the temple. And I want you to see how he begins here in verses 1 and 2 when he says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. And notice he says, serve the Lord with gladness. So when he says, all you lands, he's speaking of people everywhere in all lands. Everybody's called to worship the Lord and to serve him. And I want you to see something here. When it says, make a joyful shout, their worship is not to be subdued. It is loud and it's joyful. Sometimes when we come to church here, we have to be reminded it's okay to sing out loud. It's okay to, to raise your voice. Now, you, you know, the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord, and that's the best some of us do. 
You know, some, sometimes, and sometimes we can sing so loudly, we'll see the person's wig in front kind of flipping over their forehead, you know. But some people are subdued in their worship. It's interesting to me, but it's true, and I understand why. And of course I do. And yet the Bible over and over again says, my worship, when you worship to the Lord, it's not to be reserved in the sense that you're afraid. It should be open. And it should, be, it should be as loud as you're comfortable singing. And I encourage you to do that, by the way. I encourage you to sing with a full voice to the Lord. Because a lot of us have spent some time in front of the mirror with that hairbrush singing whatever song we think is so good. And we've done it at full volume, you know, and enjoyed ourselves as we did so. And some of us climb in our cars and we're driving down the street and God knows that we're the best thing that's ever hit the airwaves as we're singing down the street. Then we come to church and we're real quiet and subdued. I think it should be the opposite. When we gather together to worship the Lord, you know, we're not singing to one another. We're singing to Him. And, and if I'm being distracted by somebody's voice and all, maybe my concentration isn't in the proper place at that moment. I need to be concentrating on him. So I want you to see that. Their worship isn't subdued. It is loud. It is joyful. That's what he means when he says, make a joyful shout to the Lord and serve the Lord with gladness. In Psalm 32, 11, we read, uh, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Psalm 47, 1, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Now, as you're worshiping the Lord, it's one thing to come and sing loudly and praise him wonderfully and all. But that is shouting with joy to the Lord. But not only do I, do I make a lot of noise, we'll say, as I worship him, but I also am to serve him. So it's not just lip service that I give to the Lord. I don't just come and sing songs in church, in other words, but my life is a worship song to God. My, my life is a song of praise to the Lord as I serve him. That's the point he's making. Serve, he says, the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with joy. Rejoice as you serve him and worship him. Now, it's interesting because as I was looking at this particular psalm here, and he says in verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. I looked up the word serve because, as we know, the Old Testament is uh, by and large written in Hebrew. And so I wanted to look up the word serve there just to make sure that I was understanding it. And, and indeed, that word serve there uh, speaks not only of your physical labor, but it also carries with it the connotation of your worship. So serving implies worshiping, and worshiping will imply serving. You don't divide the two. It goes together. I remember a couple of years ago, somebody was speaking to me, and they said something like this to me, that there was a, a former member of our fellowship who had complained to them, and, and sometimes people think that I want to hear the complaints that people have, and so they told me it. They said, well, the person complained against you because you're always telling the church that they need to serve. And I said, I am? I'm always saying that? I'm always saying that? They said, well, you know, that's what they say. So they went to a church they don't have to serve in. I said, well, that's an interesting way to look at things because worship implies service. It always has. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. I want to show you something there. Matthew chapter 4, and the first portion of it, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 10 of Matthew 4, and the first portion of it deals with the temptation that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, goes through as Satan is tempting him. We know that there's a series of three temptations that basically are aimed at the three basic areas of a human life that can fail. Less of the flesh, less of the eyes, and the pride of life. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, 8 through 10, Matthew records a temptation that Jesus endures, and notice what it says here. It says, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. I want you to see Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Now, what do you mean, Jesus? Well, this is what he means. 
What you worship, you will serve. What is the number one thing in your life is your God. Where you put your time, your talent, your gifts, where you put all of your thought life, that is your God. That's what you meditate on. That's what you support with all of your efforts. That's the thing that is the Lord of your life. And whatever it is that you are, you are serving, in essence, you are worshiping that. And you know what? It could be anything from a relationship it could be a job. It could be a pursuit of education. It can be the car that you're driving. It can be the way that you dress. It can be a variety of things. But whatever you put your attention on, whatever keeps your mind occupied most of the time, whatever it is that you, you expend your energy on, that is your God. And when Satan was speaking to Jesus and he said, listen, I want you to do something for me. I know that you have come to lay claim on all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give you those things. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer the shame, humiliation, and the torture of a death like that. If you have come for the world, I will give it to you. You see, Adam yielded that to me because he had been created for dominion. But when I was able to, entice Eve and Adam fell along with her through choice, he basically abdicated what was once his. And now I am called the God of this age. So all of these things have been given to me and I give them to whomsoever I will. All I'm requiring of you is to simply pay homage to me, recognize me for who I am. And if you do so, I will give you these things, for they are mine to give, and you don't have to die on the cross. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, Get thee behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. Get behind me, because it is written, You shall worship the Lord thy God alone, and only the Lord thy God are you to serve. Worship and service always go together. They always go together. When you genuinely worship the Lord, you find ways to serve Him. And it's not just in a church like this, by the way. It's not just being an usher, a greeter, parking lot attendant, Sunday school teacher. No. It's everywhere that you are. Because worship isn't an occasion. Worship is a lifestyle. It's not something you do once in a while. It's what you do as a way of life. So you worship the Lord when you're driving to church as well as when you're driving away from church. You're worshiping the Lord when you go to school tomorrow or to the job tomorrow. You're worshiping the Lord wherever it is that you are. You're in a state of remembering who he is and remembering who you are. And, and you know that there are temptations out there that will draw you away. We'll, we'll ask for your attention. We'll ask for your finances. We'll ask for everything that you have. You know that. And so you say, no. You say, I can use things, but I'm not going to abuse those things. I can have things, but they're never going to have me because the Lord has me, and I'm going to worship him, you see. And so as we turn on back to Psalm 100, he's speaking about serving the Lord. You worship and you serve him. But remember always uh, what Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says. Remember how Paul says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Remember he says in verses 17 and 18 of Romans 6, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. What you worship, you will become like. Never forget that. What you worship, you will become like. That's why when people like things, we call them materialists. Because what you worship, you become like. You're known for that. And so you serve the Lord. 
And as you worship and serve the Lord, the Bible says you become a Christian. You become Christ-like. The Bible says you become godly because you're worshiping the Lord and you're becoming like him. So serve the Lord with gladness, he says. Come before his presence with singing. Verse 3, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And he says, know that the Lord, he is God. That word know speaks about acknowledging or confessing. It's a call really to recognize accountability to God. Know that the Lord, he is God. Not only that, he goes on to say, it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. In other words, he made us, therefore we belong to him. And he is our great shepherd. We are the ones who are referred to as the people, his people and the sheep of his pasture. He is our great shepherd. We belong to him. He made us. We didn't make ourselves. Pastor Chuck, many years ago at a pastor's conference, told us, now you got to imagine this for a minute. We were all men. We're all pastors. And Pastor Chuck is, is my father's age. And so as he was up there, he was talking like a dad to his boys. And that's how he speaks to us even to this day. He speaks to us like his sons, and I love that about him. And, uh, and he was teaching us many years ago at a pastor's conference, and he, and he shared, you know, how the Lord loves us and, and how he gave his son for us. And then he, he, he goes off into teaching us through using a story of the gingerbread, the gingerbread man. You guys remember the, anybody old enough to remember the gingerbread man? Well, uh, a lot of us oldies grew up hearing that. Um, you know, somebody once told me that. I'm not that old, but they told me. It was Marie. She told me. But anyway... Um, you know how this baker made this little gingerbread man? And then the gingerbread got up, and he ran out of his bakery, and off he goes down the street, right? And then the, the old gingerbread man is chasing him down, and, and some wolf gets hold of the gingerbread man and takes him, and he's going to eat him or something like that. And Pastor Chuck was sharing, us, sharing about that with us, and he says, and how this old man was walking through the streets and all, and, and he was crying because he had lost his little gingerbread man, and... and uh, and he looks into the window, and, and the gingerbread man had been sold, and it's inside of this window, and there he is on this tray, you know, waiting for somebody to get him. And the old man walks in and says, that's my gingerbread man there. And the guy says, well, that may be your gingerbread man at one time. He's mine now. He, he came here, and he belongs to me. And so the old man said, but I made him. He belongs to me. And uh, the proprietor says, listen, if you want him, you're going to have to pay for him. And so the old man takes out his money, how much you want, and he basically bankrupts him for this little gingerbread man. And he takes the little gingerbread man, and he looks at him, and he says, I made you, I bought you, and now you belong to me. And when Pastor Chuck said that, I really thought he was going to say, I made you, I bought you, now I'm going to eat you. No, that's the, that's the kind of God that a lot of people worship. You know, they think he's going to just destroy them. But he's a God who made you, he's a God who bought you, and he's a God who loves you. And if we could only understand that today, I think our lives would be different. If we could understand how immense the love of God is for us, even a portion of that, if you could understand, if I could today walk out of this place saying, you mean it is he who made me and I didn't make myself, that I am a sheep in his pasture, that he is my shepherd and, and, and he loves me. Isn't that what Jesus Christ said? I am the good shepherd and the the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. If I could only understand that once again, because I belong to him, I could worship him and I could praise him. I could thank him because he's the shepherd who sought me out. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 12 through 14, and Jesus said it this way, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting his truth endures to all generations. Why should we be thankful and why should we bless him? Well, he says here, because he's good, merciful, and his truth endures forever and because we are kept by him. 
The psalmist in Psalm 103, verse 17 says, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children. His mercy is everlasting. I thank God that every day his compassions are renewed towards us. Every morning his mercy is once again given to us. And then finally, Psalm 101, beginning at verse 1. This is a psalm of David. It's a psalm that relates to living a holy life. He says, I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord." This is a psalm where David commits himself to live wisely and in a holy fashion. Verse 1 tells us why we're to praise him. We praise him, he says, because of his acts of love and his acts of justice. The word mercy in the Hebrew is chesed. It speaks of God's covenantal love towards us. And so we worship and praise him because of his love, his loving and mercy towards us and because he's righteous. And so he begins to speak of how we should live. He says in verse 2, I will behave wisely in a perfect way. That word perfect speaks of a complete or a blameless way. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will, I, will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. When he speaks of behaving wisely, the word wisely means in a way that is instructed, in a way that is prudent, in a way that is careful. In other words, I will be diligent, I will be disciplined, and I will be committed to a life of service to the Lord. He speaks uh, of that perfect walk. That, that word perfect means to be sound or wholesome. It's unimpaired and innocent. It speaks of living a life that has integrity. So he's saying, my life, my home will be dedicated to you, and in the confines of my home, I will be a believer. You see, what happens sometimes, and we know this is true, and it's, it can be true with any one of us in this room, starting with me and all the rest. Uh, we can be wonderful here in the house of God, quote-unquote, as we call our church congregation when we gather together. We can be wonderful. We can be tremendous. I mean, we can be people who know, you know, when, when I say, let's turn to Hebrews 9, bang, you're there. Let's turn to Romans 6, bang, you know where that is. You know, let's turn to Leviticus, you know where that is. We can know all of that, and it can show in the way that we open up our Bibles. As a matter of fact, Sometimes we can even look at our Bibles and we can see notes and we can see etchings, we can see markings, we can see red and yellow and, and green and blue and various places that we have marked up over the years. But that doesn't mean anything if my life hasn't been as marked up as my Bible. It doesn't mean anything if those marks that I have on this book here have not been transferred to my heart. Because I can mark up a book, but God wants to mark up my heart. He wants to write his word on the tablets of my heart. He wants his word to be so firm and, and so fundamental to my life that it changes the way that I think and the way that I act. He wants my, my doctrine, the things that I teach and believe, to be, to be manifested in my lifestyle, you see. And that's what David is speaking about. It's one thing for me to say, um, we all need to serve the Lord, and, and people say, amen. It's another thing when I'm home. And my wife is watching the way I am. And my children are watching their father in action. And over the years, as a, a father to my kids, over the years I have, I have I've asked them for uh, report cards on my behavior. You know, what am I? Who am I to you? What do I mean to you? What can I do that's better? I can remember when my son David was a, a young, young, young little guy, less than 10. I can remember I was unjust to him. I did something that was wrong. It was just wrong to him. And I remember speaking to my son, my son David, and 
And I said, you know, son, I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was wrong. And he looked at me. I'll never forget. It's obvious it made an impact on me. He looked at me and he said, that's okay, Dad. And I looked at him and I said, it's not okay. It'll never be okay. The way that I treated you will never be okay. And you shouldn't say it's okay because it's not. It was wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. You see, every person here in this room, well, we talk a little bit better than we walk, don't we? But David here is saying, you know what I want to do? I want to live a life that is complete. I, I want to I abide in the ways of the Lord and, and have a maturity about me. You see, in verse 2, when he says, I'll behave wisely in a perfect way, it speaks about a maturity, a, a wholeness. Uh, and when he says, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart, I want to be completely blameless before you, Lord. And in all that I do, from my home throughout the kingdom, I want to have a, a, a right standing before you. So, so how can that take place? Well, he tells us here in verse 3, how can I have a walk like that? Well, verse 3, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Now, first, he says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. In other words, I'm going to pursue what is good, and I'm going to reject the world, and I'm going to reject its evil. I'm going to have a blameless heart and a blameless life. That word wicked there is an interesting word. You might find this interesting. The word wicked is the Hebrew word belial. The word belial is, another, is a word that is used sometimes to describe Satan. It's another name of Satan. It literally means worthless. It speaks of that which is ruined or is unprofitable. So he's saying, I'm going to be committed to you, and I will pursue that which is good and reject Belial. Now, Jesus in Matthew 6, 24 said it this way. He said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and earthly wealth. In other words, you make a choice. And so that's what David is saying here. I'm separating myself to you. I will demonstrate my commitment to you and live a blameless heart. I will not pursue the things of the world. I'm not going to pursue its evil. I will pursue you. Secondly, he says, I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. I'm not going to have a relationship with those who do not love you, who could influence me for evil. Remember this, ungodly friendships will encourage you to live in an ungodly way. If you cultivate relationships with people on a friend-to-friend -friend basis, Friends always influence other friends. So it's wise for you to understand, one, what does it mean to be a Christian? And two, how can I be an influence to somebody else? Because either I am influencing somebody else or they are going to be influencing me. So one of the things that I've learned to do over the years is to define relationships. I have friendships and I have ministries. Friendships are relationships with people that encourage me, I can encourage, that strengthen me in the things of the Lord. We can have fellowship in Jesus Christ, and the better ones are the ones that make me stronger in Him. Ministry is when I have somebody I love, but I'm careful with, because I know that their influence can draw me away from the things that I've decided I want to pursue. And so before I even am near them, I would pray God, give me strength make sh and help me to make sure that I keep my eyes on you even for the short time that I'm going to see this person because I know that they can influence me for evil. Ungodly friendships will always influence us to do evil. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Paul says, Therefore come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Separation from and separation to. Come out from among those who do not have relationship with the Lord, and I will receive you. Be separated from sin and be separated to me. 
Be separated from the things that take you away from me. Be separated to the things that will bring you closer to me. And so, David, how are you going to worship the Lord? Well, I'm going to set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. And then he goes on in verse 5 to say, Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I'll destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. Now, this is interesting. When he says, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I'll destroy, that word destroy says, uh, means to put an end to. It literally means annihilate. Now, as the king, David is saying he will not tolerate slander, gossip, or a false witness. In other words, the kingdom that God has given to him to rule must be righteous and filled with integrity. Now, by way of application, slander and gossip must never be tolerated nor ever practiced. Slander and gossip very often are the things that are most often tolerated, though, by believers. Some people actually enjoy hearing gossip about somebody else. Sometimes we might even think of gossip almost like getting a sample of candy. Marie and I go to uh, the Brea Mall, and there's this chocolate place. I forget what it's called. I, I wish I could remember. I'd tell you. It's got good, good chocolate. And, and there have been times when we've been walking through the Brea Mall, and Marie likes this particular place, and, and I go with her in it. I don't mind it my, myself. And we'll walk in, and they have these truffles. You know, and, and, and we, we only get one. She'll get one and I'll get one. So we look at all of these truffles. I think it's Ghirardelli's. We'll, we'll be looking at these, these truffles and I'll go, oh, that looks good. That, ooh, that's got coconut in it. And that's got an almond in it. Oh, that's all chocolate. Ooh, what's Dutch chocolate? Oh, that looks good. And we'll be looking at them. You know, ooh, look at the strawberry. They've got a, ooh, chocolate strawberry. And if we, if we stay there long enough, they get tired of us, and they give us free things, so we'll leave. You know, we're there for hours sometimes, but it's worth it. <laughs> and then they'll give us one of these truffles, you know. Would you like a sample? <laughs> of course. <laughs> We've been here two hours. Why wouldn't we want one? So we'll go, of course. And so they'll, they'll pull one out, and they'll give it to us, and then you just kind of put it in your mouth, and you take a bite, and it just melts in your mouth, and you're going, oh, man, this is good. Do you have any free coffee? You know, sometimes they do. And you eat it, and you drink their coffee. It's just wonderful. It just goes down. But you know what? There's an interesting proverb. Proverbs 26, verse 22, it says, The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost parts. There are some, unfortunately, that gossip is something sweet to them. They want to hear it. They want to know the inside scoop on what's going on. And, and sometimes there are clusters of people who have nothing better to do than to talk about somebody else, and they do. And the Bible says, no, this isn't right. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, listen to this. These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. A false witness who sows lies, and one who sows discord amongst brethren. Somebody says, well, pastor, there are times that people want to gossip to me about things. What should I do? Many years ago, I was talking to an old saint who said something that I've never forgotten. He said, when somebody wants to gossip to me, I simply tell them, the Bible teaches me to love my neighbor as myself. And you are speaking about my neighbor. Therefore, I can't receive what you have to say. You know, my mom taught me something when I was a kid that I've never forgotten. It's not found in the Bible, but the principle is there. She says, never forget the person who gossips to you about somebody else 
is the same person who gossips to somebody else about you. Never forget that. And it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. If somebody finds it easy to tell you things about somebody else, they are also finding it easy to tell somebody else things about you. And so David says, I want nothing to do with that. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. He goes on in verse 6, My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, a blameless or mature way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. And so I'm going to consider those who are faithful, those who are blameless, to be the ones I want to associate with. These are the ones I will have serving alongside of me. It, it, in, in, uh, in his kingdom, he found it right to have righteous people, people with integrity, to serve alongside of him. In the church, the same principle works. That's the kind of people who ought to be serving within the confines of the body of Christ, those kinds of people. You see, David's commitment was to excellence. He had a desire to, to do a great work for the Lord, and therefore his, his house, speaking not only of his, his home, but the government needed to be righteous. And if he's going to encourage righteousness to exist in the land, then he needs to have those who are righteous helping him out. And so the wicked simply will have no place in Jerusalem because righteousness needs to reign there. Now, obviously, the, uh, the time when, when righteousness does reign is going to be when Jesus Christ is, uh, is moving, but I uh, is serving, uh, rather uh, ruling here when, he serves in, uh, when we serve him in his messianic kingdom. But the bottom line is, and it's very simple, and this is a principle, by the way, that I've taught to my staff. It's something that I have given uh, in leadership conferences. So it's a very, very simple thing, and I'll say it this way and, and, and begin to close. I, I will tell my leadership this. Uh, I say to them, strive for perfection, and you will reach excellence. Do the very best that you can and never be satisfied giving anything less than your best. I learned that the hard way, by the way. My dad used to try and, and, and teach me that, and I wouldn't listen to him as a kid. When I was 17 years old, it was in 1968, I was a senior in high school. My dad took me to a, to a Ford dealership in, uh, in Downey. I grew up in Norwalk. He took me to a Ford dealership in Downey and uh, walked me onto the car lot. And as we were there on the car lot, he walked up to this little Mustang. It was a 1968 Mustang. It was burgundy with a black interior and a stick shift. I still remember that car. And my dad walks up to me and he says, David, if you make the honor roll, I will buy you this car. And I said, I don't want this car. There was a green fastback with a, with a, a 390. And I walked up to this green fastback with a black interior, and I said, this is the car that I would want. I want that one there. I want this one here. And it was uh, quite a chunk of change. It was a lot more than my dad was willing to spend. But he looks at me, and he says, well, I, oh, that's move. And the salesman comes walking over, and I, and I said to the guy, I want to take this on a test drive. And so I got behind the driver, you know, the steering wheel, and and now off we go. I can still remember driving on down the street, 17-year-old kid just driving down a brand new car, looking at people like, yeah, I'm cool. And I remember driving around, and my dad said, well, you know, son, tell you what, if you can make the honor roll, then let's see about what car you can get. I didn't make the honor roll. My dad didn't take any chances, you know. He knew I was stupid. No, I, I, <laughs> I didn't care. I just barely graduated. But you know what? As funny as it may seem to me now, as I recall this some, you know, many years later, 37 years later, I, I think about it, and I think, you know, what my dad tried to do with me is what I tried to do with my kids, which I guess most of us have tried to do in some way for somebody else. It was very basic. I used to tell my kids this, whatever you put your hand to do, do it with all your strength. It was one thing said of Jesus Christ, he does all things well. And I said, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's eating, whether it's drinking, whatever it is that you do, do all unto the glory of God. Now, they may not have done that yet, but one day I think that they, that they will. The way that I, when I was 17, I didn't understand what my dad was trying to do. My dad was trying to get me to do things well. That's all he was trying to do. 
And he wanted to put that carrot in front of me on the stick so that I might move in the right direction. Didn't work with me then. But what did work with me is when I got saved. What did work with me is when I began to read the Word of God. What did work with me is when I began to realize what leaders need to be. Leaders need to have character. They need to have moral excellence. They need to have vision. They need to have drive. They need to have these things if they're going to bring people where God wants them to be. And it's the same thing in my life that I encourage you to now in whatever it is that you're doing. Whatever it is that you do, do it well. And that's what David wanted. David said, I want to do things well. So I'm going to eliminate the things from my life that keep me from doing those things well. And I'm going to bring into my life those things and those people that help me to do it well. If you can think that way, God will bless your life. But if you think that you can walk in a holy way and not be influenced by ungodly friends, you're wrong. If you think that you can have friends around you who are always gossiping to you and you're not going to be affected by their gossip, you're wrong. You need to have a heart that says, look at the Lord hates this, so do I. I want to do what is right because I want to be blessed by him. And I will do those things, selecting those who influence me and influencing others because it brings glory to God and it benefits my life. When you understand that, the Lord will bless you.